Hello everyone, this is Sean Taylor, Field Application Scientist Manager for BIRAD in Canada. And in this final video segment of the Ultimate QPCR Experiment, we'll be discussing a stepwise approach to performing a valid QPCR experiment. Just a reminder that all of the information in the Ultimate QPCR Experiment video series, including this segment, were published in Trends in Biotechnology, in the article of the same name, The Ultimate QPCR Experiment, Producing Publication Quality Reproducible Data the First Time, by Taylor et al. In that article, there is one table which summarizes the steps required to perform an excellent solid QPCR experiment to give highly precise reproducible data. Each of the steps should be followed in a stepwise process from one to six and starts obviously with the design of the experiment with reference to figures in the article where required. The final figure in the article describes the criteria for selecting between qPCR and digital PCR based on sample type, primers, and contaminants that may not permit qPCR to be amenable to the quantitation of the nucleic acid molecules in the sample, where digital PCR may be more appropriate. This decision tree starts by validating primers with a pooled cDNA or genomic DNA sample. The selection of the pooled sample is very important and should be a representative sample from the experiment. The most representative sample from any experiment would be a pool of control and treatment groups such that the pool represents the average of the target quantities in the sample for all targets and the average of the contaminant levels. This sample typically is recommended to be diluted to dilute out the contaminants to permit good primer annealing. And then all the primers for the experiment should be tested using that pooled sample at the optimized annealing temperature. And again, the decision stops in this decision tree will refer to figures that can provide more detail from the article at each of these stops. So this particular stop where we test primers in qPCR at optimized annealing temperature is well described in figure 4b of the associated article. Presuming we have good sigmoidal amplification curves in our qPCR test and a single melt curve peak, then the products from that qPCR analysis should be run on a gel. And this will be to confirm that we get a nice single band per primer pair on a gel at the correct molecular weight, which would denote the correct amplicon. However, if the amplicon has not been sequence verified, it would be recommended to cut the bands out of that gel and send them for sequence verification, just to be 100% certain that the primers are amplifying the correct product. Presuming this step passes, then a qPCR standard curve should be produced. And again, this is described very well in figure 4C. Presuming the standard curve reveals good reaction efficiency with the pooled cDNA sample or genomic DNA sample, and that would be efficiency between 90 to 110 percent, then the sample should be run in qPCR using the appropriate dilution and plating, as referred to in figures 3a and 4c, to assure good reaction efficiency and minimal technical variation between the samples. Presuming good data is achieved for the individual samples, then in the end, a qPCR workflow was applied to this project. However, there are certain decision-making processes that occur that move to other paths in, in the decision process. For example, if when running the qPCR amplicons on a gel, multiple bands appeared, then the primers should be redesigned. 
and then revalidation should go back to the beginning. If the qPCR standard curve gives poor efficiency, this would likely be consequent to the fact that the target is low expressed or the samples are highly variably contaminated, but typically this is from low target expression. And then a DPCR, a digital PCR optimization workflow and analysis should be run. Presuming that the standard curve gives good reaction efficiency, and then we dilute the samples to the appropriate dilution based on the standard curve, but then achieve variable data. And again, this could simply be because of low expression in the sample or low target abundance. And then the variable data achieved from uh, diluting the samples is because the samples were over diluted in the sample, which would have been required to dilute out contaminants that would affect CQ values. Then a digital PCR workflow could be utilized to achieve the data required to assess the target concentration in the sample. Because of course, qPCR would not work in this situation because the samples, although would, although would require dilution, if they weren't diluted, then the standard curve would tell us that under diluted sample would not give us good reaction efficiency and poor reaction efficiency would negatively affect the CQ values. So because digital is not dependent or very low dependence on reaction efficiency, then the effect of, of higher levels of contaminants in the samples are disappear for the digital PCR workflow. So to summarize, qPCR is an excellent technology that should be used in situations where the primers have been well validated and samples have been appropriately diluted. <clears throat> but in situations where the dilution effect of samples or the, or the levels of contaminants in samples are, are negatively affecting the qPCR data, then the complementary technology, digital PCR, enables the assessment of those types of samples. So this concludes the video segments on the ultimate qPCR experiment. Just a few points to nail home. A CQ value does not necessarily mean a result that reflects the biological question. And an amplification curve does not necessarily represent actual data in the qPCR experiment. Taking the time to design an experiment directly reflects the data quality and reproducibility. And the validation of primers assures results that reflect the true target quantity in the samples, as opposed to artifactual data generated from contaminants that could affect the primer annealing and the TAC efficiency that could artifactually raise or lower CQ values, inconsequent to the amount of actual target in the sample. Reference gene validation is, is essential to assure accurate and precise results, and reference genes should be tested, a panel of reference genes should be tested at the beginning of any new project to, a, to pick the correct reference genes to use for a given study. Extreme care should be taken for data analysis, and I personally don't recommend Excel spreadsheets for calculations. They are fraught with the potential of formula propagation errors and copy paste errors, especially in larger studies that require multiple plates for analysis. CFX Maestro from BioRad permits the data to remain within the software for multi-plate analysis and clean data output. And finally, Droplet Digital PCR provides an excellent tool for samples that are not amenable to qPCR and should be considered as an option in those situations where the qPCR data 
generated is either variable or for samples that are contaminated or for genes that are lower expressed.